Welcome to episode 184 of the Necronomicon.com. You know that feeling when you're searching for a new horror book, but you're just being stared down by a wall of Stephen King? We're trying to change that. We're Butcher Cabin Books, a new horror-focused bookstore giving shelf space to indie horror writers. Don't worry, we still carry King, but he's quarantined to his own section. Learn more at horrorbookstore.com, where you can buy books online along with merch and mystery boxes. Or you can visit us in person in Louisville, Kentucky, where we're open year-round. If you're looking to start your own podcast, you should check out Libsyn.com and get up to two months of free podcasting service when you use our code NECRO, all caps, N-E-C-R-O. Libsyn provides you with great customer service and support. They have real-time podcast analytics, free podcast guides and tutorials, and everything else you'll need to get started podcasting today. Go to libsyn.com and enter the promo code NECRO today. And check out the Necronama.com wherever you listen to podcasts. I am James Sabata, horror author, screenwriter, co-host of the podcast you're listening to right now. And, uh, and this movie was great, but I don't know. The shark... Just didn't do it. Wait, that's Jaws. All right, never mind. Jesus How are Christ. you, Don? Hi, this is Don Guillory, author, historian, educator, co-host of the podcast that you're listening to. And, um, you know, just like I said to James when he first proposed doing a uh, a podcast, I'm glad that somebody decided to name an, a movie after that. So, nope. Here I am anyway. <laughs> you just don't go away. Uh, so joining us today... Mr. Dwan L. Hearn, the moon is here. Welcome to the welcome, show. Welcome, welcome back. How's it going, guys? Good. Been a while. Well, it has. You did, uh, what, high tension, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We got into That's... a very spirited and productive discussion for that movie. It's, it's oh, been yes. a year, and I still don't know where the truck came from. <laughs> <laughs> I've been searching. And I still have not yet found where this truck came. Yeah. Nobody knows. If you haven't well, listened see, to that episode, a mommy make truck sure you and a daddy truck when they love each other. <laughs> or get really drunk. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Or drink Cosby coffee. All right. So uh, I should probably cut that. All right. So anyway, uh, <laughs> Juwan, why don't you tell our listeners a bit about yourself and everything you got going on, man? Oh, well, I'm an aspiring writer and blogger and hopefully podcaster myself here pretty soon. Excellent. Wait, I'm going to correct Dwan here. I was hoping you're, you would. You're not an aspiring writer. You're a writer. Okay. You write. I do write. Then you're a writer. But I'm always, I'm always aspiring to be better. Well, that's different. I mean, that should just be a thing anyway, so that's good. Sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying new things out. I'm trying new mediums and just trying to put my, just try everything. I'm trying to try everything. Mm -hmm. what Excellent. You have the newsletter that's out now. And yes. uh, how, how's that going? Is that like, what do you what do you do with it? Tell our listeners about it so that they sign up for it. And I'll act like I've never heard of it. I'm going to feign <laughs> surprise. You ready? So I have this newsletter that comes out with, with what? Google on my website. I know, <laughs> shocking. And basically, it's just whatever projects I'm working on, whatever the people that are, I'm close to are working on, because it's not all about me. You know, We all have to work together as a community. So whatever my friends are working on, I try to put them out there as best I can. And it's just an update on just what's doing. I love it. One of my favorite things you do, um, I think this is more blog related, but maybe you'll be doing it with the newsletter now too. I love that when you go to a convention, you do like a recap of the con and like who you met, what you learned, things you found out. I love that. And I wish more people did stuff like that. Um, maybe I'm glad some people don't because it would probably be very negative, but I love yours. <laughs> and uh, and I it actually inspired me. I don't make mine public. 
but I have started writing down like memories from each con I go to because, you know, after a while you, you forget the things that you did that were cool and how it made you feel or things become normal. And so I just wanted to say thank you for inspiring that. Well, thank you. That actually means a lot to me. It, that is really important that I, again, nothing's about me, just me. And I went to this, you know, this convention and other events and, I get inspiration from it, and I just enjoy myself. I like to share those moments with other people. Uh, I did the one about a music festival, and I'd always run into people who don't figure out this or don't know how to get started with that or the, the easy way to do things. And so I wrote mm-hmm. a guide on how to go to a music festival, like all those things to research, the things to sign up for, things to pay attention to, the things not to do that I always catch people doing when I go. I'm like... Let me let me just write all this down. Oh, that's great. And then uh, you've been working on some screenplays recently. I had the joy of uh, reading one and kind of giving some input, and that was cool. How's that going for you? Are you enjoying screenwriting? I am enjoying screenwriting. I I want to take the moment to really really thank you. You've been a big help and inspiration uh, for me in that regard. So I want to tell you thank you. Uh, your feedback was honest and I needed all of that. And uh, I read some books after the fact and realized how bad my first one was. <laughs> <laughs> They're not bad. They're just, you know, not properly formatted. Not just you, anybody doing it. And even now, like I turned something into a producer and they taught me something that seems really straightforward that I didn't know. And I'm just like, that there needs to just be a locked down way to do this stuff, you know, but. Right. And you know, I, I'm not formally trained, which is what we always say in situations like this, but you know what? <laughs> I'm, I'm learning. I'm learning and I'm having fun doing it. And ultimately that's what matters. So I, I would like to ask this question of more people, but I honestly just forget, but it really ties in with you. Um, when you're writing, how important is music for you? Are you like making a soundtrack as you're writing? Are you, listening to something to get in the mood? Is it dead silent? What's going on? Oh, it kind of depends on the tone of either the story or in this case, the scene that I'm working on. When I would work on different short stories, whether it was outlining, plotting, or actually writing them, if they have different tones, I might place music that relates to that tone to keep me in that mood. If you're trying to write a happy scene, you can't listen to angry music. Because it's going to inspire you to go in a darker direction. Still, I'd be happy, but that's subjective at that point. <laughs> but I try to just match match music to mood, and I think that there's if if anything else, it supplies a good energy mm. for whatever you're whatever you're producing. What about you, Don? Do you blast music when you're when you're writing? Or oh man, I have a an interesting little. I guess process that I get into, which is I find a station on Pandora or, or YouTube or wherever, you know, it, it just happens to be whatever I, I kind of like what Juan was saying, whatever you happen to be writing, you're looking for something like that. Or if it happens to be the scene that you're writing, um, like for instance, uh, I probably said this on the show before, but with bastards, there were some scenes like bar, you know, taking place in a bar and stuff. So I was just listening to what would have been playing in a bar outside of New Orleans. Uh, and it was a mixture of anything from country to Zydeco to hip hop. And so it, it was weird because I just I found this way to put all those little things in there, except for the country, because I didn't know it's not going to happen. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just just write me for those and I'll just be like, well, you got to have this. The end. I listen anyway. to Old Town Road. That's as close as I'm going into that. <laughs> um, that's as close as I'm getting. I mean, not nothing against country music. I mean, I've I've listened to it in the past, but there's there's not a moment that I'm going to sit there and actually write something with that in the background. It's going to be '90s era hip hop, um, possibly you know some reggaeton, some uh, some blues, some jazz. Um, so my Nina Simone channel got uh, a lot of work. <laughs> as well as the Sam Cook one, and you know, even the punk station got a lot of uh, airtime when I was working. So the reason I great asked book, is, uh, what was that? It's a great book, by the way. 
Oh, thank you. That's how you Absolutely. That's the one that uh, Brian Keen blurbed as well, right? It's no, like, that's Magnolia Lane. Oh, that was Magnolia. Okay. Well, I knew it was one of the two. I guess yeah, wrong. Yeah, pretend Bastard doesn't exist, you know, so it fits in with the name. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised Jeez. my book doesn't show up to Herschel Walker's house. <laughs> anyway. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. You know, you know uh, can. Fuck him and fuck anybody who likes him. <laughs> but be good. careful because he might. Never mind. Don't, don't put it out there. He, put it out there. He might turn into a werewolf on you, so be careful. No, no, we <laughs> like werewolves. We like werewolves. <laughs> it's not him. But uh, now the reason I asked about music, uh, I recently had an incident that I've never had happen with writing before, and it was so mm. cool. Um, I'm very much like I basically make a soundtrack for whatever I'm writing. Like when I wrote fat camp, the kill scenes were all fuzzy all the time. Uh, just different things like that. I have a book called squeeze that I'm still working on. And for some reason it's the dandy Warhols, And that's mm. weird to me. Cause I didn't even listen to them until I started the book and I happened to hear a song and it just worked really well. And so now that's become a constant thing when I work on it. But so I was working on this screenplay and Hotel California really hits this one scene, right? And so every time I've ever worked on this screenplay, I listen to the song like three or four times to get ready to work on it. So I'm driving home from taking, let, let's just name drop so I sound cool, right? Like uh, I was taking Laurel Hightower back to the airport and, and Hotel California came on. I haven't even been thinking about this script. And literally... I, I just turned on like my voice recorder and started like all these ideas were just pouring out of how to fix mm. what's wrong with it. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm so fascinated by how music triggered that and just kicked this fucking door open for me. And all these things I've been stuck on for like two months. Like I literally fixed five fucking problems listening to this one song. And I'm just amazed at how music ties in. So when Dewan mentioned it, I had to, I had to go here, so there you go. That's pretty impressive. Cause I've sat on I've sat on 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 blockages for months, like you said, and nothing. I've had to go back and just rewrite, throw myself into a hole. It always happened. Yeah, right. Crazy. So I'm just, that that's 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 impressive. Hotel California. I'm gonna write that one down. Yeah. I'm gonna need this to keep happening with my other writing. No. Uh, anyway. <laughs> I suppose we could talk about this film. So uh, let's start with Dewan. I I went out of my way and asked you to be here. And I said, hey, man, you're watching it tonight. How would you like to come on and talk about it? So since since I begged you, I won't ask why you picked it. Instead, I'll ask, what does this movie mean to you? It has a couple different meanings for me. Uh, one, as a black writer and black creator, seeing the works of Jordan Peele become more mainstream, pretty special. It's kind of the same thing that happened with Albert Perry. Uh, wouldn't necessarily call him like my inspiration, but in a sense, he is an inspiration. But with Jordan Peele, I love the fact that he's out here. I love the fact that he's mainstream. He's mainstreaming horror, which is not a lot that I, that I personally recognize out of black artists and black creators. But I love it for the representation. But right now he's like one for one with me on, on movies. And so I really had to watch. Nope was really important. A one for one when it comes to Jordan Peele movies. Okay. <laughs> nice. Get Out was great. great. Get Out was classic almost. But I have some issues with us. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of logistical issues with us. But yeah. Uh... <laughs> You got to suspend belief at that point, James. Come on, dude. I just want to know, and and if you've listened to our episode, I probably said this, but it was like episode three, so that's two hundred and twelve episodes or some shit ago. I don't know, but I just always wanted to know, like, if you get on a plane and you go to another country, like, is is your is your tunnel you just like slamming into the wall over and over again trying to get to you? I don't know what's happening there. I, I have airports down there. It was perfectly fine. See, actually, it's funny. Like, <laughs> us, us went the same route as high tension. It was perfectly cool 
<laughs> until until the ending, and then you start mm-hmm. watching it back, and you're like, wait a minute. Yeah, there's some and things here all, that don't make all, sense. <laughs> and then it all goes downhill from there. But walk in the nope, open mind, even score. Let's go. <laughs> and Don, I know you've been literally asking to do nope since probably the day it dropped, if not sooner. I so was, uh, I, what, I, what I does this what, movie mean to you? Oh, man, I got to go back on this one. Um, cool. Uh, not to not to piggyback off of what uh, what Dwan said, but God damn, I can't believe I said that. Um, but Dwan brought up something that I got into. I wouldn't say I offended anybody, but it definitely did raise some eyebrows um, within on TikTok with some of my followers, because when Nope came out or was about to come back on streaming or whatever it was. I just made a short video and I said, you know, it was controversial opinion stitch thing. So I said, Tyler Perry, uh, Tyler Perry makes movies for people who um, associate with the Booker T Washington philosophy, while Jordan Peele makes movies that appeal to people who are more inclined to agree with W.B. Du Bois. And when I tell you that some people got pissed off because they misread what the hell I was saying, <laughs> they were basically trying to say, I'm like, well, Booker T is stupid. I'm like, no, I'm not saying anybody's dumb. What I'm saying is there was a certain type of political and social direction that those two men were taking that were different than the other two men. Whereas Booker T Washington, and I'm sorry for intellectual historians, I'm going to offend somebody here. Um, He pushed for respectability politics, which was simply, you know, go do a job, come back home. It's okay for us to be segregated. We don't need political power. Let's just work on getting jobs. And then eventually we'll get political power because people were going to see that we're worth, uh, we're worthy of enfranchisement. We're worthy of being able to take up space here. And that's kind of what I saw with Tyler Perry movies where, again, people love the movies. This is nothing against them. It's just saying that there are different approaches to this where Tyler Perry's movies talk about religion and family and, you know, the, these things that you should do to be a good person. Right. Um, whereas what I see with Jordan Peele's movie or movies, I'm sorry, his movies, it's more about enfranchisement. It's about being included. It's not having to do anything in particular to do, to be deemed worthy of having that place. Um, and in some cases, it involves you fighting back when, when you are going to be marginalized, when you are going to be sucked into the, you know, into the big cloud monster, or if your your white girlfriend's family wants to, you know, take your take your mind, or sorry, put you into the sunken place by taking your body and implanting their mind. Or in Nope, the same type of situation where it's not like, oh, I understand your problems and we're going to get through this. It's like, no, fuck you. I'm going to fight back against you. I'm not going to give in to this. Whereas what I saw with a lot of Tyler Perry movies is kind of like, oh, except this is the way that life is going to be and work towards something else. Not to mention he he has a real issue with with women in his movies. It's (laughs) very... Very close to the argument I've always made when it comes to uh, King versus Malcolm X. Yeah, they essentially wanted the same thing, but their approaches were absolutely were, were different. Exactly. Uh, and you know, every it's, one works for some, one works for others. Neither one's ultimately you know good or bad. They're just different approaches towards the same end. Mm-hmm. And where you know. Where Jordan Peele will throw in a bunch of movie references, a lot of Easter eggs, things like that. Mm-hmm. I don't see this. I've never seen that from Tyler Perry. It's it's this is the movie. Here's the beginning. Here's the middle. Here's the end. And here is some type of lesson that you should have learned along the way. Whereas Jordan Peele's movies, at least for me. You have to go back two, three, four, five times. And every time you watch it again, you find something new. You find something else that was laid out because when I first saw the movie, I got into an argument and the only thing my wife and I ever fight about are like movies and pop culture. So when we saw no, we like, we were like, no, this is what this meant in the movie. And then, 
so we were even debating over Jupe, uh, Jupe's idea about um, sending the horses out, right? So she's like, no, he hadn't done it yet. I'm like, yes, he had done it before. That's what he had all the other horses for. It's just that he's never get, he's never presented it to an audience before. This is the first time. And so when I went back two days later, because my mom was in town to watch it because she wanted to see it, I caught that part where the wife is saying, hey, we've got a couple more passes for the friends and family pre-show. We're going to be doing it Friday at 6. And when I saw that, I came back home. I was like, Claudia, you were wrong. I was right. <laughs> this was the first time they were doing it with an audience. All the other times, it was just a horse that they sent up into in, into the pillow alien monster. Or the so you told your wife that she was wrong. How are you enjoying your new apartment and living alone? <laughs> well, since I've moved into doghouse <laughs> hotel, <laughs> doghouse condos. <laughs> But again, that's resist. the only stuff we ever argue about. It's it's always like pop culture and, and movies and TV shows and, you know, what was somebody's motivation behind this and, you know, what exactly was the the director or the author or the, the writer, uh, screenwriter looking to do. And I tell you, like, I, I saw it, I think this is my fourth time seeing it. And there were even a few more things that stood out where I was like, holy shit, I did not catch that before. As far as like this is the way this the direction at this point was going, uh, whether we're talking about, you know, the flashbacks with Gordy's home or um, the the almost uh, signs like or signs esque moments where OJ is talking to his dad or there's a there's a moment where he's talking to somebody in the past and what that person says affects what he's going to do in the present. But long answer to your, to your question about what does it mean to me? What it means to me is this. Beyond the representation, we're also seeing great depth within horror to the point where people are not recognizing horror when they see it. Because if you advertise this as, oh, it's an, it's an alien invasion movie, you're going to lose a lot of people. If I say it's a horror movie, you're going to lose a lot of people. right? But if I say Jordan Peele's new movie is this... We don't know exactly what it is. And even from the previews, it was unclear what was going on. Because, of course, I, I yeah. tried to I tried to figure it out. I'm like, well, is it aliens? What's going to be involved? Because even that scene where they show Gordy about to do the fist bump, that was in the preview. It was sold as though that was an alien's hand, you know, reaching out for a child. <laughs> so, I mean, just the, the the way they promoted this is, again, it was outstanding to to redirect you, to get you curious about going into the movie, not knowing exactly what direction it was going to take. Uh, whereas Get Out, again, depending on your viewpoint, it's any type of movie. It's ultimately a horror, but there are so many things leading up to that that are going to bring people to come see that movie. Uh, same thing with us. You have... Uh, um, Winston Duke, uh, you have Lupita Nyong'o that are, you know, the stars of this movie that are selling the movie to get you in here to see exactly what's going on. You don't know if it's a home invasion. You don't know, you know, if it's some weird, obscure sci-fi. Uh, you know, you don't really know until you're sitting there and you realize, holy shit, this is going somewhere deep and dark, no pun intended. And then you get, you know, to the last 10 minutes, you're like, some of this doesn't work out. Some of this doesn't make sense, but fuck it. You got me. You got me with this one, Jordan. So uh, first I want to say how much I love the poster with uh, Stephen Yuen. Mm -hmm. uh, I, when I saw the poster the first time before the movie came out, I was like, his hat doesn't look right. Like it looks very off. Doesn't look like a cowboy hat. And I, I really thought it was like, like, uh, this is going to sound rude to whoever professionally makes posters, but I thought like they couldn't get rid of a background correctly. And uh, <laughs> so, so then, you know, once you realize that that's the entity behind him, it's just so beautifully done. Mm -hmm. It's a great poster. It's one of my favorite posters. Now it's also a reversal of jaws. You know, the right. jaws poster is the person being safe up above and jaws coming from below. This is, the exact opposite of that. And I love that, but it's also possibly the same because 
aren't we really the creature that's attacking this creature at this point? But anyway, um, I, I want to add what this movie meant to me. And uh, it, it's really, I am so excited about how horror is going mainstream and how we're not locked into being a horror movie. Mm-hmm. We, we can do other things and be horror adjacent and we can take all these genres and just fucking throw them in a blender. And this is a Western. It's a mm-hmm. sci-fi. It's a horror movie. It's all these different weird things. It's whatever the throwback to Gordy is. You can throw that in there. It's a sitcom gone wrong. I don't care. Whatever genres you want to throw in. This is just a giant fucking mix of these things. And I love that so much. And I, I'm not the biggest fan of Nope. I love the second act and the third act. The first act is really, really boring and, and long to me. But with that said, it still just means so much that horror is being taken seriously, but also allowed to expand. Right. And I, my one complaint is that there wasn't, I don't want this movie to be hilarious, but I would have liked a little more humor in places. It was very dry a lot of the time. And, uh, well, and I felt, un- but I felt unnecessarily dry. Like, right. I just, I felt like there could have been more going on to make it to really catch you off guard, you know, get you in that. Ha ha. That's funny. Oh shit. You know? Right. Right. But yeah. So there you go. I think the comedy was just really set up subtly. It was like, sometimes it hit, sometimes it missed. I think there was supposed to be like, comedic back and forth just in the the roles of um m the uh, emerald the sister yeah i definitely. think she was supposed to be like generally the, the comic relief and then you had this almost know everything but know nothing tech guy mm-hmm. angel mm-hmm. those, those days right so yeah i think you had those like, you had those characters that are supposed to interact and have their comedic beats. I, I think some of them fell a little short. Not quite like Popeye's biscuit dry, but like. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you get for but not like, sponsoring us, Popeye's. <laughs> but you know, like KFC biscuit when it's set out for a minute. <laughs> ben Shapiro. Never mind. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so like, like, okay, uh, for example, before you continue, that right there, you all you said was one person's name. <laughs> I crack up because I know I, I follow the reference yeah. all the way down. Uh-huh. That was subtly placed, really funny. <laughs> Those are the kind of jokes that did not take place in this movie. Well, and there's a couple little things that I found really funny, but then I was like, is that supposed to be funny? I don't know. But well, like one of my favorite parts is the woman who says your name is OJ and it's God just the it. look on her <laughs> face. And I was like, man, that's a great joke. Like, you know, but it's also so, so completely, uh, exactly how my mom would react to that. <laughs> so very, very real to me. See, um, I like how I like his face. After she said that. Cause <laughs> yeah, while her too. face is like, Oh, Hmm. And his face is like, <sighs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. Was o- Otis Jr. Otis Jr. <laughs> right. It's like, yeah, first time I ever heard that. Yay. Well, that's definitely the sign of somebody who it's it's been said to him so many times. Yeah, exactly. Like, I, I, I get it. This is my name. Um, And I was thinking, but I figured I'm like, I don't need to mention them on the show. But it's it's like somebody if their name. I don't know, happens to be something obscure. Hell, we had a guy in our in our in basic training whose last name was Cox. C O X. Yeah. So that became the whole joke was he was private Cox. And then it just turned into, well, you know, if you become an officer, you could eventually become Captain Cox. It's like a superhero. Then you could be Major Cox and you sound like you're in a porno. And then, you know, if you keep going in your career, you'll eventually just be General Cox. Nothing special about you. So that just became this long thing where he's like, I get it. I know what my last name is. And it was just one of those things that that hits you of why should it be shocking that somebody has a name? 
And, and yeah. I mean, as far, as far as the situation where I'm going to be uncomfortable or I'm going to make fun of your name as though I've never he- heard that word before. Right. Like no one drinks orange juice anymore since the 1990s. Right. <laughs> not only that, not only that, we're looking at, let's say this film is, let's just say it's 2022, 21, 2021, 2022, right? OJ does not have the, now he would for that, that actress, but OJ would not have the same presence in Otis's life, in Otis's pop culture and his references without somebody mentioning OJ and what OJ did, because yes, OJ did do that shit. Um, wrote a book. Yeah, he wrote a book. So it, if I did it, which see, you know, I don't, I don't it. believe he did that part. Well, yes, yeah, true. I believe there's a book. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he, there's a, I, there's I, a lot I, of people. I don't yes. believe wrote their books. <sighs> but anyway. but yeah, just the, just the reference there where I you know our our age group we're gonna get it right off the bat. It's kind of like okay, it's a blonde white woman talking to a man named OJ. We get the subtext here. We get you know yeah, we get the symbolism that's going on of which I also kind of question like I, uh, I'll go there later. I'll I'll wait. I'll save that one for later. Just just tell us you're gonna forget. No no I'm not. I've got it in my notes. Well, shit. well, anyway, we're going to jump around anyway. The spectacle of it, right? Because one of the themes within this film is is spectacle and obsession with spectacle. And there are very few things I remember that took up as much of our time and our attention than OJ. So with with everything that's been covered about it, you know, with the trial, with the chase, with... You know, even the the TV movies that were made based off of there's still one of these things like, you know, where you were when OJ was being driven by Al Cowlings through through L.A., through the highway. Um, yeah. Oh, can we all answer you, that next? <laughs> oh, James, I'm going to ask finish, you. No, finish your thought first. Finish your thought <laughs> but, first. But we know we you know, we all have some attachment to it. Same thing with the Challenger explosion, the 9-11 um, the invasion of Iraq, you got all, or when Michael Jackson died, like there are these moments when you're like, oh shit, I remember that like it was yesterday. I remember everything that was around it. I remember the way the news covered it. I remember the way the tabloids covered it to where there was endless conversation, endless coverage over this to where we knew every fucking thing about the attorneys involved in the case. We grew into, we had so much spectacle that surrounding this that um, Marsha Clark changed her hair because of the way in which people, pundits, talking heads on TV, as well as viewers, were talking about how they can't believe that that woman has a, a perm like that in the 90s. So she went and got a makeover. And the same thing with with other people that were as part of the trial. It became a thing of like getting in to to see the trial when it's taking place, watching it on TV every day if you couldn't have access to the trial in person, and then gaining access to people who were associated with the case. I only knew Cato Kalin for one thing prior to this moment. It was on some late night, like B-level movie that Rhonda Shear was playing on USA for Up All Night. And I remember him from that movie. Other than that, no one knew who this guy was until he was talking about, yeah, I heard some banging. I was I was in the guest house. I heard some banging outside, and I went to go see what it was. But we were so enthralled with everything that any of these people were doing, who they were dating, who they were possibly the illegitimate father to, um, <laughs> to the point where people ha- – I don't know. The OJ spectacle, the OJ phenomena that it is – I don't know if we would have something similar to that because there's so much stuff out there, but we still do get caught up in random bullshit. Uh, so, James, you know, yes. what about you as, as far as this spectacle, since we're starting with OJ, like what what do you remember about <laughs> that? Uh, well, I, I can tell you where I was because mm-hmm. it's a really stupid story and I'm still angry about it. Um, <laughs> so I was I was being a normal white kid and watching Murder, She Wrote. And, uh, and it was at like the last, like six minutes of the show when it cut away to OJ, just driving down the road for like 19 fucking hours. And I never found out who killed, 
who killed the people. And now I don't know what episode it was, so I can't look it up. And so OJ also killed my dreams. No. <laughs> That's literally what I remember about OJ. I just remember being so fucking angry that he inter- interfered with the show I was watching. But uh, outside of that, man, it was just it was just chaos. Like It was mm-hmm. just such a spectacle, like you said. And... I don't know. It was it was so pointless to me that I didn't keep up with it like I guess everybody else in America did, but it did nothing for me. To tie into that from where I was, I was in... Were you watching Murder, She Wrote? No, what? In, you were where? Okay. In middle school. Sixth grade. Like, I remember, like, we stopped science class to watch the, the verdict. Mm-hmm. That's how big of a spectacle it was. It was enough of a spectacle that 11 and 12 year olds had to interrupt our science class to watch the verdict with generally no ultimate content of what was going on. <laughs> Look, but that's, that's, just, that's just the reach that it took. Like, that's how big of a spectacle it really was. Like, no matter who you were, what you were doing, obviously it was for the adults more, than those, more so than it was for us. But that's how big of a deal it was. Everything stopped. Just for- I, I just find it funny that you were in a science class as well, because I was, <laughs> I was, in, I think ke- it was chemistry. I was in a chemistry class, and it was uh, Mr. Olivier. I'll never forget him. Um, he he looked like a human Muppet, like that. That was because he was always so nice and happy and everything. I was like, God damn! Like, what shit are you on? You're always in a good mood. Um. But I remember they they wheeled the TVs and yes, kids, we used to have to have the TV wheeled into the room because they weren't in the on room the carts. on the cart. And um, the principal like came over the PA system and she was like, um, we're making the decision to let you guys know about the OJ verdict, blah, 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 blah. Um, we keep in mind, please, uh, you know, keep your decorum or whatever bullshit that they said to like not overreact to what was going on. And I watched reactions like when I went back and looked at the news that later that day and I looked at reactions that I included in in my class when I was talking about that period of of the 90s. And our school was primarily black and white. Um, You also had um, a good good number of students from uh, from Asia as far as from uh, Indochina or Southeast Asia, India. And then we had a good number of um, Mexican-American students. And you could I mean, you could cut the school in half and basically predict predict what somebody's views were on the trial. So every roughly every white student that was in the in the room uh, because they, they brought three classes to sit in one room because, you know, there weren't enough TVs for every room. Every white student was in that room was pissed off. Every black and brown student was like, fuck, yeah, he, he's not guilty. And every Asian student, for the they were basically split as well, as far as like whether it happened or, or not. And I bring that up because I'm talking about the way in which it's so part of the culture, it's so part, so it's so important, but not important at the same time, that this is something that is going to consume us. Um, much in the same way recently with, you know, the the Queen's funeral or everything that that deals with the the British royal family. Like they went to a basketball game a few days ago and reporters were asking the players how it felt to have them in the building. And the players responses were golden. It was like and it was just it was just another game. <laughs> like, I didn't talk no to him. I don't I don't care. And um but you see how some things get turned into spectacle and then you have this moment where other people question if is is this really worth our time? Um, And I don't know. I I even see that early on in this film um, about being worth the time or just worth the effort because OJ is inheriting the business from his father mysteriously dying. You know, everyone thinks that it was just random shit that fell out of a plane. Uh, and, and struck him and ended up killing him out on their ranch. Now he's got to take this this business over. And the business itself that's going to employ the use of these horses decides, fuck it, we'll just go with CGI. And you see how 
people become or people and industries become very replaceable uh, or just not seen as important. I mean, even to the point where where Antler, who's had a great film career, you kind of question, like, why the fuck are you shooting a commercial? I mean, the base of the way they end up talking about him later in the film about how great he is. Like, why are you, of all people, shooting a commercial? Yeah. I didn't have a so, question. I just was, I was just oh, riffing. I don't care more of that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like that. But no, like, I, I, you see how it was sudden, and he, I, I don't think he was prepared. You know, it was such a sudden, random thing that happened with his dad. And he wasn't prepared. You can tell by how nervous it was when he was sitting there with a horse in front of the green screen, you know, waiting for his sister to jump in. And he's just, it's like, I'm just here. You know, he has his head down a lot. Right. Very quiet. And you can tell that he's now been pushed in this situation. He is not ready. No, and, and not only that, you talk about him having his head down. I don't recall going back and watching it. I don't recall him looking anybody in the eye at, during that during that area. I mean, like he looked toward people, but I did not see a moment where he's like looking someone in the eye. Or if he did, it wasn't for that long. No, it would have been really really short, really subtle, and that that's to me that speaks a lot to the acting, but it also says a lot about that what that character's overall role is, and it also plays into uh, how he interacts with Jean Jacket, the the mm-hmm. creature in the sky later on because that's he gets to that point where he realizes I can't look at it I, I can't look at it if i look at it, it it'll consume me which mm-hmm. is kind of like as you were talking about you know spectacle same thing we if we start paying attention to it if we start looking at it it'll consume us i like that a lot which is what it does <laughs> i mean I guess we can go here. Have have either of you entered in a, into a conversation unsolicited with somebody that ends up talking about celebrity news? Not that there's anything wrong with it. You know, if you enjoy celebrity news and tabloids and, and all that type of stuff, you know, more power to you. But have oh, you yeah. ever gotten into what, what was it like? Oh, man, this one time I was sharing a hotel room with my friend and he kept watching 90 Day Fiance and he would just talk about it and talk about it. And I was like, these aren't even real celebrities. Why are you so invested, Don? You know, I know this is a lie because it comes on (laughs) Sunday, asshole. And we were in the in the in the room from two from Wednesday until and then we left on Sunday. Asshole. Anyway, uh, no, I I mean, I let's say I dated a lot of. uh, Younger women when I was in college, so it happened a lot. And uh, I don't know. It's always weird to me because I don't I don't care about celebrities nearly as much as other people do. Like even at cons, like uh, you know, I'm going to use Jason David Frank. Jason David Frank obviously just passed away recently, and I've never watched anything he was in, but I got to know him as a person at cons. And he did so many cons that I saw him all the time. And he'd be like, oh, you worked with me at Phoenix that one time. And then I was like, oh, yeah, I'm an author guest now, blah, 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 blah. Right. And we got to a point where like we weren't friends or anything like that. But like if I walked by him at a con, he'd always wave or that kind of thing. And so I guess celebrities to me, I I don't care about the celebrity nature of celebrities. I'm, I'm fascinated by who they are as people. And, and I'm glad that everybody's getting paid because other people care about them so much. But, right. but my answer to your question is no, when that happens, I usually go, Oh shit, I got to go do this. <laughs> I try to meet that with indifference. Cause funny enough, my example actually did have to do with 90 day, uh, 90 day fiance. <laughs> I, Look, I get it. I talked to a lot of people about 90 actually, day fiance. <laughs> it's actually got something to do with you. It's actually got to do with my wife. My wife loves the show. My wife and my mother-in-law both. And I get this phone call. And she's like, Dwan, Dwan. I'm like, what? What's going on? See, when your wife comes to you with that, with that kind of energy, you're like, wait, where are the kids? What's wrong? What's going on? Yeah, no kidding. Like, you'll never believe who just moved in next door to mom. I'm like, um, <laughs> who? She's like, uh, Paul and Carini. I'm like, 
It's like, yeah, Paul Green. I'm like, did we go to school with them? Like, were they in my class or yours? Like, who who are these people? Why do I know them? Like, why is this special? And it pe- turns out that they're a couple from uh-huh. 90 Day Fiance. And I, I haven't, like, the show first came on. I knew what it was, but I otherwise never cared. So I never watched the show. I had no clue who these people were. So while my mom, you know, my mother-in-law and my wife and, and all these other people were like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God. I'm just like, this is the dude whose rake I borrowed yesterday. <laughs> like, it was just a guy. Like like James was saying, I got to, like, I didn't know him as this celebrity or I didn't see them in all their, you know, TV spectacles. Mm-hmm. But, I, you know, they were the the couple that lived next door who had a kid and you know i was watching out for the kid like you do with all your neighbors and it's like hey you need to borrow something i got you i need to borrow a lawnmower you know my out of gas da, 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 da. you know just recognizing them as people and so when everyone's kept trying to go into this like all this hoopla i'm just like look i don't know anything about all that i just know that when i need to borrow something he's got me so boom there you go <laughs> <laughs> Like, I just try to like, dismiss it and move on. So, Don, I want to bring this uh, back to the film for a minute because you were talking about spectacle, and this all ties into getting stuck on something that doesn't matter. And uh, I don't know how many fucking people I saw post about the shoe. Ugh. The, sh- the shoe means nothing to me. The shoe is a distraction. The shoe is is the shoe is that. This terrible tragedy happened Mm -hmm. and we're so immune to it now and just so used to this shit that we overlook the tragedy and go, why is that shoe standing up? And that's all the shoe is to me. Well, no, the thing is, you're right. That's all it is. The only reason why why um, Jupiter or Jupe sees it that way, it I'm sorry, I'm going to go ahead and give my opinion. (laughs) <laughs> the only reason you see it that way in the flashback is because you're seeing it from his perspective and having gone through trauma, you misremember things or you have something that you focus in on. You might say like, you know, I was just, I just kept looking. I heard the screams that were coming from the building next door. Um, you know, the husband was killed his entire family. I heard this, but I knew if he heard me, um, he'd come out, you know, he'd come into that room and kill me as well because I'm his son's best friend. And I happen to be in the house playing when he decided to kill his family. But I kept looking at this poster of, I don't know, Smurfette, right? I just kept looking at this picture of Smurfette. I just focused on that. I focused on that. And then somebody tells you like, there was no poster of Smurfette in there. That was like fucking Care Bears or, or Rainbow Bright or something. I know I'm showing my age. Um, really are <laughs> and that's that's what i see is happening with the shoe it's he has it on display like that so when he ever whenever he goes back and thinks about that moment he's trying he's finding something that he may have focused in on that kept him calm kept him quiet when gordy is running around killing it which by the way the dad's death is the dumbest one in the movie <laughs> <laughs> okay The entire studio (laughs) has been cleared out, right? People left their shit, which I thought was a cool touch. Because when people run from a situation, it's not, oh, shit, let me grab my coat, my sweater, my purse. Let me get all this shit. You see a chimpanzee going crazy, mauling people, smashing people, biting them, scratch, you know, doing all this stuff, right? Everybody is gone. And the fucking TV dad walks in. No, no, Gordy. No, no. No, no, don't do that, Gordy. Which, again, I thought went back to the memory of this kid, or I should say this adult. That It may not have happened that way, because one, it doesn't make sense that he would have come back into the room. But it does make sense if you're that kid, I'm sorry, you're that adult trying to remember a traumatic event from when you were a kid and not getting the details. You, you remember certain things a certain way. And there's, you know, there's something that happened when I was a kid. I was three, four years old. I saw what could have been a mass murder, but I could just be misremembering it. And it was just an issue of I'm out with my babysitter 
and there's some disturbance that was taking place across the parking lot. Police were there, ambulances were there, and I just remember a lot of blood. But that could have been, again, from the trauma from seeing that and the age and forgetting things, that, that may have been the EMTs helping people and somebody had blood on their shirt or that might have been the color because I was so far away from it. So the shoe I see is it's remembering it a certain way, not necessarily the correct way, not necessarily an incorrect way, but remembering it the way that you thought you saw it happen. No, I think that you just made me like it more because I was looking at this solely as a movie viewer's point of view and not the kid in the traumatic situation honing in on one thing. Mm. So you made me like the shoe more than I did. Good work. I'm still oh, trying to figure out that. the whole point of that part of the movie. Of, of the Gordy? Oh, I got you. Gordy's, please do. Because I got as you. I'm watching this Hang movie, on. Yeah, before you do, let's oh, no, finish. Go ahead. Okay, yeah. As I'm watching this, I'm like, okay, I get it. It's, it's, it's this guy's background, and it's kind of like, what he was in the show business is kind of leading into that. But like we put a lot of time and energy on the Gordy TV show tragedy, whatnot. Didn't make I I missed it. I missed All the right. connection. I this, hated it. This. I was so bored by it. <laughs> I just I want to get this out before you do this. Like I was literally like you could cut all of these fucking scenes and I oh. wouldn't miss anything and I would like this movie so much better. So go ahead, Don, tell me why I'm wrong. All right. No, 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 no. It's not it's <laughs> nothing about being I wrong. Know. I've seen the movie a few times. I read some articles that were written about it. So <sighs> The the issue here, Dwan, uh, let's go back and uh, approach this issue as far as wh okay. what you didn't like about it. What I did like or did not? Didn't, didn't. I felt, like James said, like you could remove... Okay, so there's a point in time when they're in the office and he's going over the, the tragedy and what happened mm -hmm. in sort of a small monologue. To me, that was good enough. We did not need the scenes. We did not need the flashbacks. I don't see how Gordy impacted the modern day storyline at all. All right. Here's how it works. So you've got you've got Jupe, uh, Jupe Park telling that story, right? Mm -hmm. He's the only one who knows what happened, what really happened, right? So he's now riding the fame from Kid Sheriff. He's on this new show as a kid. This is going to be his big break, right? Because he was he was a sidekick or or an ancillary character on the other show. Because Emerald even refers to him as like, "Oh, you're the Asian kid. Oh, what happened to the black kid?" Because it was it was even understood kind of like you didn't even have fucking names. Like you didn't have a name I could remember. Then you you get on this show where you have a central role on the show. You know, you're one of the kids in the family. You're not the neighbor's kid. You're not the kid's best friend. You are the kid or one of the children of that family. So this is his moment to kind of get this big break, right? Mm -hmm. When I see him, again, this is me. When I see him having that flashback, or at least a couple of flashbacks, like even the point where the wife comes over and starts rubbing his hands and, you know, trying the hat on before she gives it to him. I see that as everything I've done since since this show that should have made me a star has failed because even the 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 little frontier town that they have is struggling. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to use something else to get a spectacle, bring something, bring something uh, to this place or make use of what's out there, bring it to this place, get people to come in and see it. And by word of mouth, now we're going to be jumping. We're going to be making a lot of money. We're going to be staying. We're going to have to expand. Because in the six months from Otis Sr. dying to that moment that we have Otis Jr. going to Jupe and saying, like, hey, you know, what's what what's what's the deal? Like, how much money are we looking at? It's the same deal I was offer I, I was offering your dad. We initially are thinking horses, right? But then OJ quickly clears it up and says, oh, he wants to buy the ranch. Because he is ex he is expecting this to be the thing, be the thing to, that he could not only make a lot of money off of it, he's going to become famous for it, 
and famous in a sense that he can expand even more to where he can now take over the Haywood property to where he can actually have all of this because he knows it's there. I mean, we, we get the understanding that he knows that the that Jean Jacket is there because he's been feeding him horses for six months. So he, you know, it's he's trying to train, trying to domesticate this alien in the same way that those guys who were with the TV show were trying to work with a domestic, I'm sorry, trying to domesticate a chimpanzee. But as Otis Sr. says in one of the flashbacks, some animals ain't meant to be trained. And then the other one, uh, I think Otis or OJ says is trained animals can be unpredictable. And so I trying to draw the connection of he went from being the sidekick and being someone who witnessed exploitation to someone who is now going to use exploitation to make himself famous or to become part of this system again, as opposed to a kid TV, uh, a kid on a TV show who is now running his own, you know, amusement park. I hear what you're saying. I, <laughs> I, I get it. I hear, I hear what you're saying. I'm gonna let you fall. I will have to talk, but you know, Beyonce had the best music video. Sorry. Um, <laughs> oh, man. He who shall not be named. Ye who shall not be named. <laughs> Ye who shall not be named. Well done. But no, seriously, though, it's like, I, okay, so I get that. I hear you. Again, I feel like that could have been, first of all, it could have been told a lot clearer in dialogue, mm -hmm. even just in mm -hmm. that office. While he's, you know, before, instead of practicing the lines, he was like, this is going to be it. Right. I've tried everything else. But this, this is it. This is the thing that's going to get me over the top. Boom. That line by itself would have answered, answered every question I had, would have brought back. It, it would have made sense with just that line by itself. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of scenes, a lot of runtime that we did not need. And just to not convey that message more clearly. And that was, that's almost all of my issue with Nope. Really, it was just like so much of that runtime was just directed somewhere else. And I'm just like, I don't, I don't know why. I don't know why. I, I, I did read, Peel said that the chimp is symbolic of his own career and being told what to do and mm. things like that. And when you look at it that way and expand it into everyone who, when Get Out came out, went the comedy guy. Right. You know, um, I, I think I think there's definitely a case to be made for that. And I think it's interesting. And I don't want to say the execution didn't work because I'm sure it worked for a lot of people, but it didn't work for me. And for the same reasons Dewan sang, it was just so long. And so if I saw it once, I think I would have liked it more <laughs> seeing it repeatedly. Eh. And, and I get, again, it kind of rolls into the spectacle, right? Cause without that, we start with dad's death and we don't get a big spectacle moment. So, right. I don't know. No, it, it all makes perhaps. sense. I just it just doesn't work for me. Yeah, likewise. No, I'm not. I'm not disputing. Like you could have, you could have minim minimized it even more, um, which has been done with other films where you just kind of see like a two or three second flash, like um, what was it? Uh, Violent Night. Like there's this moment where Santa Claus's character, you get an understanding of who he is and his background in like a five to ten second clip where nothing is said. You you Nothing understand even happens. It's it's literally a camera shot that yeah. pulls out a little bit, and that's it. And uh, and yeah, just fantastic. Something like that, maybe. But with that said, uh, Mr. Peel, if you ever listen to this, I just want to point. Out, spent twenty minutes talking about OJ Simpson before we got to shit. So what the fuck do we know? <laughs> <laughs> there was a reference. <laughs> it made sense. It connected. <laughs> That's why she looked at him funny. I just wanted to Jordan, throw that in there. <laughs> Jordan Peele expected that part of the conversation. That's why she reacted the way she did. There it's you okay. go. Justified. Justified. <laughs> but a lot of the movie is broken up by uh, the names of the horses. And we mm -hmm. kind of focus on yeah. the horses. 
in the storyline a lot. A lot of the story is broken up using these kind of title cards of uh, little horses. And when we get to the end, because they had named the, the creature Jean Jacket, the last segment is called Jean Jacket. But there's a segment called Gordy. It's a whole segment blocked out called Gordy as we're going into the whole background of 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 the show and what happened on that on that last day. Mm-hmm. I'm just like that's just so much attention that I wish that there was. I wish it tied into the news to the modern the modern timeline a little bit more clean or at all. You know, mm-hmm. I just I wish it would tie it in better. That that if it's going to be that symbolic. I wish there was a way of tying it in. That, at least a little bit more clear, even for me. That, that's my that's my hang up. Well, let's talk about the one tie in. Because why did he bring this former co star <laughs> to this event? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, what kind of person? <laughs> like, what the fuck, man? See, it's sad because I know this answer, too. (laughs) All right. Give it to me. Well, one, I mean, there are two things going on, right? He's still trying to live off the credit from that one thing that he did, right? And also with her. So it's 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 an extra selling point because as he claims, I'm not saying he, I mean, this is, again, somebody who's boasting about stuff that may not be taking place. As he claims, like, people pay to come see that, you know, Gordy's home museum that he has. And there was a couple that, you know, paid him X amount of dollars just to spend the night in there. This is, you know, one, you're seeing the, 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 the terror that Gordy did to this woman. Right. So you get that visual, but it's also a play off of what Oprah Winfrey did. So the woman is wearing the, I think the same colors or the same type of outfit that one of the guests wore onto, or when uh, Oprah Winfrey was interviewing her, and it was the woman who was attacked by her pet chimp, or or former or former acting chimp. So there, there were Jordan Peele's trying to make some connections to stuff that's going on in the real world or has gone in the real world. Um, some subtle, some knock you over the head. But um, as far as Jordan Peele's rationale for doing it, trying to make the connection with with a real event with Jupes. I just see it again as he's he's still tied to, I guess what could be deemed the glory days. His his fifteen minutes, yeah. And he's he's looking for overtime. But again, like you mentioned, that like if he was the last person, the only one that really survived it, and to tell the story, he could have made that look as as he wanted to, you know, into all the the different whatnot. But she's right there. So there's clearly someone else that survived it, and the, the the military team came in after the fact and, and cleared it out. So other people right. can attest to what occurred. Man, for me, it's just uh, I don't know. It just seems so horrible. It's like this person that was in this terrible tragedy that that like you're you're a connection to that tragedy she was in, and now you're like, hey, come to this thing. When I feel like he knows what's going to happen, so he knows this is a tragedy as well. What yeah. the fuck, man? Like, I don't. I don't think that he set out to kill everybody, but like. Well, no, that I think that was unplanned. <laughs> I think it's fair to say that that was unplanned. Because even uh, in that scene, he goes and he's like, "Oh, it's uh, it's here early." Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. I don't. Okay. He's like scrambling. Try to figure out. So he was really, really unprepared for for what was happening. What happened it's just still so weird to me. Like I get the rationale that Don said, but you know, uh, I will say where he says that people pay to go into that little room, that is just he's a professional carny, and that is a <laughs> carny story. And as somebody who goes to cons and is a table carny. I admire it because he sold it with conviction and made them believe it. But I don't believe it at all. That is a hundred percent bullshit. He's well, never yeah, charged anyone himself, to go in that room. It's about making himself <laughs> more than what he actually is. Yeah. It's all in kayfabe. It's true in kayfabe. It's fine. Exactly. <laughs> wrestling's still real to me, damn it. I know. Everything and... comes back to wrestling. <laughs> CM Punk will be wrestling any day now. He's going to be reinstated as champ. 
It was all I work, was. man. It was all a work. Yeah, it was all a work. <laughs> All right. See, this is something that I, I thought was, I mean, you see it, you see it a couple of times. So there's TMZ guy who comes out there with his little electric motorcycle, which I thought was awesome to, to have what a that. Great because, kill. Well, it's, yeah. it, it's that. And you also have that visual later with Emerald and, and OJ where he's on one side with a horse and she's on the other side of jean jacket with the electric motorcycle and she can't start it. Because of all the electrical interference, but OJ has no problem because he's riding a fucking horse. Um, but crisis, right? This is something that we've often asked when we've seen stuff on social media, which is, okay, you're in the middle of an emergency. Why are you recording? So even beyond this idea of uh, the spectacle associated with a person, right? There's also the spectacle associated with something that is taking place, whether it's, you know, uh, a police standoff or a car accident. I mean, which we've all been guilty of. We pass a car accident and you slow down just to see uh, whether it's a car accident, whether it is um, any type of emergency that's taking place. You often see people putting their smartphones up and recording it as it's taking place, as opposed to, I don't know, uh, interfering <laughs> or trying to help. Uh, in, in some with situations where it's safe to help, or in some cases, like oh my gosh, I'm live streaming while I'm being robbed, or you know, somebody's breaking into my house, and people in the live stream are like, use your phone to call the police. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we're we're even caught up in the spectacle of this because motorcycle guy um, gets knocked off the bike because he hits that that energy pocket or that energy block barrier, whatever it is. Flips off the bike, which was a cool, again, cool visual. <laughs> and it's even cooler because I think Angel asked, like, what happens to an electric mic, uh, elect, uh, electronic mic, mo- yeah, electronic motorcycle or an e-bike once it hits like a dead zone or however it delivers it? And boom, you see it right, right then. Um, but when the guy is down, he's got that mirror helmet so you can't really see who he is. And he's got the one little eye hole out for, for using the camera, right? Um, he initially shows up because he wants to get the skinny on what took place at the ranch. But then when Emerald, um, you know, wants to avoid the question, he starts asking her some more questions. And then when OJ goes out there to rescue him, he keeps on with this thing of being caught up with whatever the story is. He's probably broken his neck, maybe his legs, arms. He's broken something. But he's on the ground not complaining about any appendages being broken or not being able to feel them. He then scolds OJ and says, why aren't you filming this? To demonstrate like the power that this has over so many people. And he's almost offended that something great is happening and he's not and OJ is not recording it. <laughs> Even to the point where at the end he's like, I need my camera. I need my give me my camera. I need yeah. my camera. It's like I'm sorry, dog. You're about to die. And he's like, I need my camera, though. But I need my camera. Like, that was his only concern. Not help me up. Not get me out of here. Not call for help. Literally, it's just, why aren't you recording this? Let me have my camera so I can do it. Mm-hmm. And it's like, hey, you don't want to go. And even when Emerald was just like, hey, man, you don't want to go down that way. Don't go right. down that way. He's like, I'm going to go. That's what the story is. You're trying to keep from the story. I have to go. And even because, I mean, with with cameras and paparazzi, I mean, one of the things that led to uh, some changes or at least the way that people review things was with. And I brought up the royal family earlier, but with the with the death of of Princess Diana, you know, all the, the stuff that was going on in her life, all the tabloids, all the news leaks, all these things that were going on were, you know, were killing her and. This desire for more information and more prying into her private life resulted in, you know, them speeding down uh, down the streets of Paris, you know, and hitting hitting. uh, I forgot what it's called, but basically hitting the side of the road, one of the barriers or barricades that there was. And the the paparazzi were the ones who were chasing them because they needed that story. They needed that scoop like this TMZ guy. I, you know, get my camera. Why aren't you filming? You're going to miss this. And it, it's kind of that same thing. When you see people that are obsessed with a certain story, celebrity, whatever it is, 
you kind of have that same question if you don't have the perspective of like, why is this important? Why do you need to see this? Why do you need to know this? Whereas, you know, everyday folks, we don't get the opportunity to pry into each other's lives <laughs> or go through their trash in some cases. Nor should we. People can go through my trash if they want to. That's fine. I don't recommend going through mine. There are diapers in there. That's about it. <laughs> Convinced me. I, I will not. <laughs> I, I should be a lawyer. But, you know, tying into that actually goes into like sort of the, the main direction of, of the movie. Because uh-huh. in, when the father passes and it's left to, I'm assuming, OJ and Emerald both. Mm-hmm. There's no money there. No. And that's why they're selling the horses. And that's actually a, a, the theme that's driving the story. They're needing money mm-hmm. because they're not getting the gigs. And we, we get that from that scene with the horse and whatnot. They're not getting the work. They're losing money. They're having to sell the horses. So they're losing you know, potential income. And it's in this, this spit of desperation that leads to the oh, we got we to gotta get cameras. We got to get security cameras. We got to hook all these up to catch them so we can sell the story and right. be, be rich. It's this, it's almost this desperation of fame. And especially in the world we have now with, you know, content creator creators who, you know, there's, there's a difference between those who are out to put up news and information and genuine entertainment and, and have a, a, a good working format like you guys. And then other people who are just spending hours a day doing whatever weird dances or eating strange food or mm-hmm. messing up macaroni and cheese. <laughs> it's it's true. There's like a whole bunch of people who oh, are messing I've... up macaroni and cheese yeah. on TikTok. And it's an abomination and it's almost a hate crime. I, I digress. It's this desperation of fame that mm-hmm. is motivating us to to go to the extremes and do all these things and to spend the money we don't have in order to make the money we might make all for we're not even going for 15 minutes of fame. We're going for like three and a half minutes on a video worth right. of fame. You know, we're we got attention spans down to 60 seconds. We're just trying to get the shot, trying to do the one thing. You mentioned People recording during tragedies. Hey, why don't you use that phone to call, you know, nine one one? It's like, no, 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 no. I'm live streaming. I'm gonna get all kinds of followers and likes, and that becomes the motivation. Not helping you follow man. Not getting yourself out of the situation. Not even self preservation. It's gotta get the shot. I gotta get the shot. Which is what, what Andrew comes in and says. That's yeah, easy. I gotta get the shot. So even in old school, it's just like, no, 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 this is going to be it. This is going to be my claim to fame. We're going back to Juke. He said, that's what that's what Juke's trying to do. This will be my claim to fame. That desperation of fame. You know, I got to tell this story and display this shoe. That's a desperation of fame. You know, going here, I got to get the shot. It's desperation of fame. Hey, why aren't you recording? It's desperation of fame. Mm-hmm. And that is such the motivator. It's literally the motivator that drives this movie forward. Yeah, and and you know you brought up the 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 aspect of, um, I guess just being seen and the desperation that goes into it. Um, so with with like Antler's character or the, the 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 obsession with with these things like the shot for Antler, I looked at Antler a different way when I looked up. And I wouldn't necessarily say fan theories, but actual you know reviews that that addressed him. I think Antler. From what has taken place, he's not doing it for fame, right? Because he makes that comment early on when when Emerald calls him and says, "Oh, you know, you'll you'll be you'll just end up you'll the chase will never be over. Uh, you're always going to be chasing that dream. You're always going to be looking for the perfect shot, right?" And yeah. some of the fan theories and even some of the the reviewer theories are that he's dying, and the reason why he decides to come out there is. He's not going to do this for a financial gain. He's going to do this just to prove that he could do it. So when, you know, when he push, uh, you know, waves off Angel when they're up on the on the hill or the ridge and lets him know, like, fuck it, I'm going up. Um, 
it seems as though he's kind of he's he's had that moment of peace of like I'm going to get the shot. I've got it. And you know what? I'm going to get consumed by this thing. Because another theory that's out there is that the the shape, I'm sorry, the shape, Jesus. Uh Jean Jacket, the the alien uh is just supposed to be Hollywood or the entertainment industry. And it's going to consume you and then spit you out. Some people are going to be useful. Some people are going to have a lot of a lot of extra time. Uh, but ultimately, the industry is going to chew people up and spit them out. I like yeah. it. Yeah, Make them too. disposable. But I mean, in all of this, uh, I want to be famous thing definitely plays into his sister. Mm-hmm. And, you know, her whole, I'm an actress, I'm this, I'm that, I'm this, I'm that. And then he calls her on it and he's like, let me doing your side hustle here. And she's like, this is my side hustle, <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> which is just such a great, I, I probably fucked up the lines, but that's such a great moment, you know. Um, but I like how she is positioned as wanting that. But then I feel like she starts out trying to get the money for the shot. But And while that's still there, I still think she's doing it for other reasons. I think it's still about getting the shot, you know, Mm -hmm. like, uh, like antlers and, um, uh, OJ, he's never really seemed to care about the money. He wants enough to save his ranch and that's it, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, so I just, I find it interesting how it also shows that that mentality isn't that different from the opposite mentality. Uh, you know, like, OJ wants nothing to do with that and she wants to be famous, but those driving forces still lead them to the same places. And I, I find that masterful writing. Hmm. It literally is one of her like last stands. She's trying to work that, uh, uh, wishing well camera right. to get the shot. Still trying to get the shot. The whole thing surrounds getting the shot, getting the proof getting the money shot. And even as it's all over, the first thing that happens is everyone rushes in. The, the news is rushing in at the end. All these people trying to get the shot, trying to get the story. Yep. But I, just, I feel like she's different in that it feels like her arc takes her to a place of, of natural curiosity as well as the money. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And uh, and and also just wanting to save the place like we got to get rid of this thing. So it's also her idea, because the first thing she says is like, oh, I've I've looked on this website and this web. You know, I've been looking at this alien stuff for a while. And then she even points out, like, if we're going to sell it, we don't sell it to these guys. We will get more money if we go here. Um, And and even Angel, when he gets over involved, which I think was a, a, a cool way to bring him into this, which was. You know, I'm a tech guy. I know you guys are doing something crazy out here. So I'm going to look at your camera. I'm going <laughs> to offer to look to, to monitor your cameras for free because he's also one of those guys who's really into aliens, even makes a joke like, oh, you need to, you should check out Agent Aliens because they talk about this. But he has this genuine interest in it. And I think for him, it's it's I don't want to say the most pure reason why, but it's almost like it, it, this becomes his coping thing. Like he, his girlfriend just broke up with him uh, and she's going into entertainment, uh, fucking CW, um, <laughs> which I thought was a great touch that it, it had to be the CW because it's just, it's a, it's a channel with so much history and so many shows and the shows are hit or miss. Um, I mean, as far as longevity, but it seems as like he wants to be there to have something to do. And, develop some type of kinship because there's never a moment of like oh i definitely want to make money off of this i want to do this like he's taking stuff from work (laughs) to be able to 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 be out there as part of this hey we're going to prove that aliens exist i mean there there wasn't even at least from a presentation from where i saw it there wasn't a moment where i saw angel as a person other than somebody who wants to help um reluctantly at one point because they you know when they have that that first run in, they're like, no, fuck this. We're not, <laughs> we're not going to stay there. <laughs> we can't let this happen. He just needed friends. Yeah. 
He had no friends. Just, he just needed someone to love him. You know? Stupid CW. <laughs> all his friends, his happiness. And his woman. Supergirl's a good show, though. I'm just throwing that out there. It's a good show. Look, I can't remember the last thing I ever watched on CW. No offense to CW. It's just, it's, I have like, a lot of us, we have our uh, standard channels that we go to and we might catch something if it's streaming. So I, I've never, unfortunately. All right. Yeah, I call now, it. I call it. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I think, Juan, you brought this up, or maybe you brought it up, James, about you know the, the camera crews showing up. Um, he did, my, yes. Yeah, and, and my biggest complaint, not about the film, but I think this is a good observation but well, one by the two of you, and then also by by Jordan Peele putting this in there. We don't often think about the news being a spectacle, but the news itself is now driven by ratings as opposed to when it was basically it was operated at a loss uh, for network television. But it's now turned into a thing of ratings, and you got twenty four hour news channels uh, to where where a tweet. Um, could result or somebody taking over Twitter could result in we're going to have endless coverage on this thing and what it means, as opposed to when we talk about, does this really matter in the long run? Can we talk about something that does matter? Can we talk about something that will have some effect on our lives as opposed to um, Taylor Swift's fans can't access uh, Ticketmaster in order to buy tickets, which was all over the news. Such a huge story. <laughs> but it's but I it's also now. it's also like everything is treated with the same gravitas. Mm-hmm. Like like it could be that it could be uh, Kofifi, it could be anything. Like like Trump saying Kofifi had the same fucking coverage as Trump stealing <laughs> nuclear documents. You know, like. These are not the same things, and that's my problem with the media right there. And Obama's tan suit. <laughs> Never or the mind time he had Reagan's Dijon tan mustard. suit, Reagan's plaid suit. <laughs> or just Bush's Reagan. Tan suit. Or just yeah. Reagan. Just Reagan. Like, yeah. <laughs> because, you know, but one person just, I love in history. It's just everything is treated with the same amount of importance, and I think that's so fucking crazy. And I get that it's all the 24 hour news stuff. It's, oh, this has to seem important because we need something to talk about for the next hour, you know? But fuck, man, that's that's one of the things that I truly believe has led to where we are today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're not, not wrong. Super short attention spans that everyone has. Because you know, you you gotta keep talking about this. Oh, but this over here happened too. Oh, oh, and this too, and it gets to the point where it's like we need something. Okay, thirty seconds is up. We need something new to talk about, and that's when you get to something so minute as who said what on Twitter, and who's who's jealous of who in Hollywood, and who broke up with like why did Harry Styles' girlfriend leave? I, I don't, I don't care. <laughs> right? I, I don't, I don't care. Like who someone else is married or broken up? I don't. None of that matters to me. But you're right. They they do news entities of all sorts. They put the exact same emphasis on Taylor Swift uh, Ticketmaster fiasco with you know a missile coming for you know from I- Iran coming to America or whatever. It, it's the same exact it, it, the same people are talking about it in the same way. We got the mm-hmm. same video packages. It's the same attention, the same interview, you know, little talking heads. It's nuts. Mm-hmm. But it also Absolutely. shows that desperation. That desperation to have something new to talk about. That desperation to be the number one channel or the, the, the show with the higher ratings. It's that same almost desperation of fame that we've gotten away from discussing th- things that are important. To just discussing things, as long as you're oh, talking. We bring on, we bring on pundits. Like, like we don't even know what's happened yet, and we have people analyzing it. Yes. And I think that that's led to like 
every person between 40 and 45 having a podcast. Don, what do you think? Well, you know, there are a couple of people out there that that don't have them. I'm 39. But <laughs> you said you're getting one soon. You must have right. to wait well, for your birthday. October. When I'm stopping soon. I'm 30 soon. I'll be 39. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I don't. I don't know, man. I I still feel like, like I know I keep harping on this, but I've been just been thinking about it. I still feel like the sister has more to her storyline that kind of over overrides just the money and all that kind of stuff. And I think it's a real juxtaposition at the end where she has the shot and they're trying to get the shot, the paparazzi, right? Mm -hmm. And she worked her ass off for it. And they get to show up and they're still working. They're still doing what they normally do. Don't get me wrong. But how must that feel? <laughs> If you got these shots and then they show up, if one of them had also gotten the shot and gets to go sell it right away, holy fuck. <laughs> I mean, obviously that doesn't happen, but if it did, like, how unfair. Well, I mean, you're right, though. I think you're right, though. I think she has a, at the beginning, she's very distant from her brother. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I guess I'm just dropping you off somewhere now. It's like, no, nah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll hang out, I guess. And you, you know, there's a distance, there's a, a rift between the relationship. And then at the end, you see where I think, like you said, the motivation for money seems to go away. And now it's just like, we're in this together to complete a task. Right. Let's complete the task. And she's in it to complete the task. It's like, I will see this task all the way through, which, and maybe this is just my impression. You get an idea that she's just kind of dabbing her hands into everything because she's sort of a master of none. Mm -hmm. Pretty much. Just, pretty much. Just, so she's just trying to like just do all these things and never puts a whole lot of focus into any one thing, which is why she rattles off all the different things that she does, uh, which is putting herself out there. But then she commits to this and she commits to her brother and she commits to her family and there's a bond. And that I think she has the most character change. Mm -hmm. I'd almost say she's almost the main character. She's almost the protagonist because she goes through the greatest arc. I like that. Yeah, and I think uh, I think it also shows in the moment where she's on the bike and he's telling her to go, and and she keeps looking back instead. And, and that's the moment where she doesn't care about the fame. She doesn't care about the money. She cares about her brother. And then at the end, she cares when she sees him. Like, that's what matters. And, and yeah, she has the best story arc by far. I also, because, Duan, you brought this up as far as the, I guess, the sense of estrangement, right? Um, for, for me, I guess because she is the younger kid. Um, I think gender dynamics and age come into this as well. Whereas, remember, she was supposed to, she even points out, she's like, I was supposed to train Jean Jacket, right? And I think the the issue for her was that their father never fully trusted her to to do the right thing or really trusted, to get, trusted her enough to give her the responsibility. And when OJ takes over, I think it's still that the the aspect of he's doing it by himself. She doesn't come, but she comes late to do her little, you know, song and dance in front of the in front of the people. And it's not helping. Meanwhile, I'm the one who's out here doing all this work. I'm busting my ass on the ranch. Uh, and I, I you know, probably has a little bit of resentment for her. Um, for not being there, but also having the freedom to not have to be there, whereas it seems as though OJ's path is already dictated to him by his father and the worst peer pressure possible tradition just because we've been doing it this way. So just the, the weight of this is something that your great, great, great grandfather started and your family has been passing it down. So you got that aspect of you're the firstborn son or the oldest son. Um, and, and it is your job to take over the family business. Kiki Palmer, oh, yeah. Jesus. Emerald, Emerald doesn't have to have that pressure. She can leave, and 
I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you. I, I, my grandfather yeah, had okay. a similar situation. He was the oldest male. And so when his father was getting older or whatever, um, had him stay on the land. I mean, they had they had a good number of acres in rural Virginia. So it was him and his four sisters. The four sisters, all five sisters, I'm sorry, all went to New York City to start their lives. And he stayed back at the farm in Virginia. And it was out of this obligation to his father. Like, I, you know, you don't understand what I had to go through to get this land. I'm passing it down to you. So my grandfather never had a life outside of rural Virginia, uh, whereas his sisters all went to New York, uh, made good money, you know, had homes uh, and would come back to visit. And it was kind of like this this burden that he had to bear of I've got to take care of this because if I don't you're not going to have anywhere to come back to. And that's what I see going on with OJ and Emerald. It's like, I'm doing this shit and you can come and go as you please. You have that freedom. I don't, because if I leave, this shit falls apart. I'm sorry, James. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I I love this story about their great, 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 and however many greats. Uh, I, I love how it fits both of them. Like, he sees it just as this is a continuation of the horse business. Mm -hmm. And she sees he didn't get to have his name on the screen. I'm a fucking do it. Right. And holy shit. Like there's so much right there. Like that piece makes me okay with the scene that I don't really care for otherwise. But like, I love how ingrained in both characters that is without it being completely spelled out for us. Because that would have taken another 20 minutes. <laughs> to, to counter that, as she sure. comes up with the safety, minute, the, the safety meeting, she rattles off, you know, it's because it's three greats. I remember this. There's three greats. Because she comes in and is like, it was my great great grandfather. And he whispers, it's the third grade. And he, <laughs> yep. he whispers that because the generation different. He recognizes who that person actually is to them. Mm -hmm. She is just repeating what was said before her right she's got the script it never it is so when you notice that she's kind of reading off of the script of what she's supposed to say because that's what her daddy yeah. said so mm -hmm. it really doesn't have a whole lot of meaning to her whereas with oj he understands who this person was he understands what the story was and that there's an actual extra generation between dad and us mm -hmm. He recognizes the real. She's just following the script. She's just kind of going through the motions. Right. That kind of shows that detachment, where where this person may not have actually had any meaning to her, but meant everything to him. Yeah, hmm. I like that too. I mean, imagine those stories that you would hear, right? About, I mean, just not even not even great grandfather or great great great, but your grandfather. You would hear those, you know, you might hear these stories about what he did when he was growing up or what he did in the war, or what your what your grandmother did. And, and you hear those stories to a certain point where you put so much worth in them and self-worth into them where their identity becomes your identity. Like, I can't do this shit because of, you know, what my grandfather or grandmother did. Like, I've told James this. There is never not going to be an election that I vote. Because I had a grandfather who stared down the Klan because he was hosting SNCC workers in the 1960s. And the Klan did not mess with him. So I, I look at anybody who's like, well, I don't have the time. No, fuck you. You have the time. <laughs> so, I mean, that's that's how I internalize that. So it's it's kind of that same thing. Or I see the same thing with with OJ. It's like, like, like you pointed out. It's wrapped up into his identity, not just knowing who the man is, but the fact that I'm here because of this man. So right. I have to carry this on for that next generation, or at least until uh, until we can't. Right, until the wheels fall off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's always that generational pressure, you know, especially if someone in your family has done something great. You're like, whatever whatever the, the great thing is, it's like right. okay, grandma did it. I've gotta do something. I can't I can't let them down, you know. I was I remember I it was not until like my early adulthood I found out that my 
grandma was kind of like this big deal singer in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, mm-hmm. where there's a, a mural of her really? and others. That's in cool. Chattanooga, Tennessee. Yeah, no clue. Apparently, they went down there to see family, and there was they went to some museum for something, and they're like, "Oh my gosh, she's alive!" Because they thought because they hadn't heard from her because she moved to Luke. And so they're like, oh my gosh, she's still alive. So they were taking pictures and they, they, they drew all this attention. I was like, why? They're like, oh, you didn't know? Because grandmama did this and blah, 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 blah. She was a big singer in Chattanooga, Tennessee back in the time when, when you could only, when, when black singers could only play in certain places. You know, they were all on this one stretch mm-hmm. and you, know, you couldn't perform outside the stretch. And there's all these people who had big names in that stretch. My grandma was one of them. So she was in a museum, she had an exhibit, and I'm like, you mean grandma? <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> the, the woman who, like, makes makes me chicken salad and, and gave me my first issue of National Geographic. Like, okay. She also bought me my first CD, which is the Fugees. I don't think she realized what that parental <laughs> advisory sticker meant. That's the Fuji CD. That well, means the your Fuji parents CD. have to buy it. When I was nine. <laughs> <laughs> I was nine years old with, with the score. Thanks oh my mom. god. <laughs> that was great. Great city. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, hey, sorry. Well, no pressure is what I was referring to. Yeah. I, I'm I'm gonna ask a question of both of you. Now we talked about spectacle and celebrity and stuff like that. Um, and we talked, you know, that 20 minutes about OJ. Um what is I guess some aspect of celebrity or notoriety or whatever that you just it 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 just keeps your attention it doesn't just grab your attention it keeps your attention like what's something that you spend too much time on thinking about or being i guess treated like a dog with a squirrel backstage wrestling drama (laughs) <laughs> Same. Can I, get enough of it? Can I get enough of it? Because you, it, okay. So all things. Can, I, can I just say Alexa Bliss? Love Alexa Bliss. <laughs> I love Wait, Alexa. that's my answer. Now I'm, I'm wondering what all the backstage yeah. drama is. Uh, <laughs> oh no, I just meant I spend too much time thinking about Alexa Bliss. But all right, well, go I, ahead. I know, I know. And Gigi <laughs> Dolan, let's not sleep on Gigi Dolan. Anyway. <laughs> No, but so when you're watching professional wrestling, because it all comes back to wrestling, you're watching this this scripted program where people are engaging in entertainment combat, mm-hmm. right? So like the news. Exactly. So the the idea that these people are essentially athletic actors, okay, we're all, everyone that's in on it, we're all in on it, it's fine. They're athletic actors, actors, and they're doing a job. They play characters. They go within the script and the story. They do a thing. When it comes to the point where they're real people, and the real people are equally as mad at each other as the characters on TV are, you're like, oh, now hold on. The fake stuff scripted was pretty intriguing, but this guy's really mad. He really doesn't like him. Oh, okay. What is What did CM Punk say now? Um, and we've wandered a long, long way from the movie. Let's go back. Dewan, you wanted to talk about the uh, the design of the creature. You want to jump into that? Well, the design of, of Jean Jacket is just this beautiful parachute looking, just it's just beautiful. And mm-hmm. the mouth is supposed to, to kind of like symbolize like a camera, the way it like right. opens and sets with the shutter and the the square, like it was just he's, beautiful. He's just white trying to get the shot. Green. Exactly. <laughs> but it's like the alien's trying to get the shot of us at the same time. We're trying to get the shot of the alien. It's just back and forth. But the design of the of the creature is just gorgeous. It, it was very Absolutely. beautifully designed. I don't know if it if it I mean it's an alien, so you have to take it with anything with a grain of whatever aliens call salt. But it's just, it had no real structure. It's shaped like a 
like a ship, but then it wasn't a ship. Mm-hmm. It was an alien itself. And then it, it, it opened. And like it, when you watch that last shot that Emerald got with the well, it's just that still by itself was just like the shot mm-hmm. is a beautiful, as someone who appreciates art and photography, the shot was beautiful. And I think the, the designer of Jean Jacket deserves some credit. Oh, yeah. I I do. I dislike that the well works. Like, I don't know. Shouldn't it be affected? Well, if it's a manual one, though. The only Is it thing completely that, manual, though? It's supposed to be complete. It, I mean, it's supposed to be manual as far as you, you, you know, crank it to, to get um, your picture. But okay. I'm going to go with it. It's just a, a manual camera. Uh, well, yeah, it had to be a manual one because it was developing the film right from that area. Uh, it also had lights. Point. It also had lights. Well, it had right. the flash. Yeah. So would so, that flash work if the power I, is all out? Well, the power definitely is out because the, the music doesn't come on until it's blown up. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, oh, so then should should the flash have worked? Actually, the flash could work if it's a manual crank. All right. Okay. Well, I, I don't hate it as much as the end of Prey, so I, I'll give you that. I mean, like a, a flash bulb. Like, if it's going by a flash bulb in there, if you've got the spark, I, I'm assuming it would work, which you wouldn't need a, a you know a, an electric line that's running to it uh, if this is something that's manually operated. But again, I mean, it's Jordan Peele creating this thing, so we'll just say it's a it's another manual camera. There you go. Fair. <laughs> oh, House with Blood Rain. Boom. Yes, thank you for bringing that up because that was what I was looking at on my notes. Because that's a beautiful shot. Just this house covered with blood rain. That was glorious. Like <laughs> at that at that moment, if you thought you were in a sci fi movie, you immediately realize you're in a horror movie. Or, or your perspective changes. And what I think is cool is is a conversation James and I have, I've had before and, of course, you know, discuss it with other people, is that your characters don't know what genre of film they're in or what story they're in. And for them to go from, you know, it's a desperate family looking for money, you know, it, to, to keep this business going, right? Then it turns into sci-fi because OJ has seen something and he wants to be able to you know, determine what it is. And of course the sister's like, it's a UFO. So you keep going with it's sci-fi, you know, went from family movie to sci-fi to now with that blood coming down as far as from their perspective, because they didn't, they don't know what took place at the, the Gulch. Right. It's, it's full on horror because it's, it's still the investment of, we need to get a picture of this, this alien. We need to get this evidence. And it, they're, they're, their moods completely change as far as why they should even be there. Even with um, Angel and, and 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 Emerald when they're when they're eating with with OJ, and they're both just cutting up, making jokes, you know, trying to 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 deal with the situation. And then OJ, because OJ is the more serious character, he's like, "So y'all don't want to talk about what happened at the ranch?" <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, and like, for, there's not. We can't just not talk about it. Yeah, because for them at that moment, it's it's a fucking horror movie. Like I, I don't want to participate. I want to go home. I want to go home, and not to which that. I, home. <laughs> which is funny because we've always, you know, now I'll speak for myself. Every time you see the craziness that happens in horror movies, the first time I look at, it, I'm like, ah, nope, that nope, not doing that. No, no, no. Mm-mm. All right, James, tell. I was gonna. I was asking Jay. This is like, should I tell on myself now? <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> All right. Yesterday, I'm working at my office. One, my wife had left. I think to go to a doctor's appointment. My daughter's at school, and I hear something like knock, like fall over. I walk out of my 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 room with a computer and everything. I walk in the hallway. Hello. And as soon as the words came out of mouth, I was like, what the fuck? I will never complain about a horror movie ever again with the whole, hello, who's there? And I'm like, we we do it. 
it's that's a real thing. We actually do it. And uh, then I went back to my office and sat in silence <laughs> because I didn't want to be in that genre of movie. <laughs> Did you run upstairs? I was already upstairs. There, there was no hope for me. There's no hope if, in this room. Completely surrounded. All right. Somehow we'll make you. We'll get to the sequel. <laughs> Some magical way you fell out of a window or something. It'll be yeah, a exactly. flashback scene. <laughs> there you go. He, <laughs> wasn't, he wasn't in the house at all. The figment of our imagination. How crazy. I mean, John Kramer has been in every single Saw movie. He died the third. Spoilers. Jeez. <laughs> you mean Kevin McAllister, right? Just kidding. Exactly. Don't start that again. <laughs> I want to play a game. So uh, are we spent on notes and ready to do movie wrecks? Yeah, I'm good. And you're hungry. And we're sleeping. I am hungry. Because we're all in different time zones. Right. Well, as long as Dopey doesn't win the election. But, uh, all right, so let's move to Movie Rex. Uh, What should people watch if they enjoyed this? And, Duan, you're the guest, so you get to go first. I I thought about this one, and there's only one that really stands out because it reminds me. uh, It's with the Gordy scene, the Banana Splits. Okay. The Banana Splits horror movie is so funny. It's it, <laughs> it's this, it's almost as if Gord, the Gordy thing was its own movie. So you know, it's the banana splits we all know and love, but it's some sort of like retcon. They're bringing it all back. Something happens in the studio. The banana splits go get evil, and it's a it's a beautiful thing. <laughs> if you like horror comedy, that is an absolute beautiful movie. So if you want more of the actual Gordy stuff. Where it actually makes sense of the story. I, I watch it. <laughs> but is there a shoe that just stands up for no reason at all? all I don't right. want to spoil um, anything. So, <laughs> so for my double feature, I'm going to go Sorry to Bother You. I think Sorry to Bother You would be amazing with this. There's uh, horses and black people, right, Don? <laughs> I swear to God, Don forced me to say that. <laughs> oh, my God. I said it jokingly to actually- it was like you I have did. To do it. All right, he, but uh, he oh, no, really, it's, it's, it's more hard. about like, it's funny. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> that was good. But no, it's really it's more about themes, uh, you know, capitalism and chasing the the almighty thing that's elusive and trying to get the right stuff. But also, like, sorry to bother you. Literally, shows people working harder than humans, and uh, and I would argue that there's a lot of that in this. It's. Um, mm. It can't be easy for OJ, even with his dad, just the two of them running the place. They're working right. their fucking asses off. Uh, you know, there's just there's so many similar themes. I think that it'd be a great double feature, but also uh, they're both just really good films. And so there you go. All right, All right. Don, what are your 8,402 movies? Well, most of them got sucked up into a, uh, a pillow beast. So um <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start with the obvious ones. Jaws. That's my nickname for my wife. Wow. Jaws, Lake Placid. Um, and then, we have an episode about Lake Placid. People should definitely listen to that. And Jaws. And the next one I'm going to mention, <laughs> yeah. which is Prey. <laughs> uh, also, strangely enough, The Wizard of Oz or E.T., uh, Close Encounters, War of the Worlds, uh, Parasite, James is going to hate this next one, which is Age of Ultron. Beast, the, the Idris Elba movie that just came out this, this past summer. Um, surprised James didn't say this one, but Color Out of Space. Signs, Prometheus, Cloverfield, The Thing, Extinction, which is, I would say, is heavily underrated. Uh, Battlefield LA, and another one of James's favorites, A Quiet Place. Well, there you go. And that's All right. Well, then I guess I guess that brings it back to you, Dewan. You want to tell people where they can find you online? Um, I have my website. It's DewanLHearn.com. D-W-A-N-L-H-E-A-R-N.com. And I'm on just about every social media platform at D-L-Hearn Writes. 
Nice. Awesome. All right. Well, I suppose that wraps it up for another week. Thank you for joining us once again, man. We had a great time. Most definitely. I, I assume Don had a great time. I shouldn't speak for him. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> <We'll be> <laughs> <laughs> Fuck that guy. <laughs> and uh, and if you're in the Louisville, Kentucky area in July of next year, come see all three of us at Imaginarium. Absolutely. Might even go. take my top off. Uh, he'll definitely take his top off. It's just a matter of whether you guys get to see it or not. It'll be the top of my pen, you heard. Anyway. Sure. I was at Spirited Giving, where you literally tried to auction your shirt off on stage, telling people that if they donated enough money, you would take it off. So it's possible. It could happen. Hey, anyway. man, $20 they is $20. Put it back on. <laughs> That's what happens when I do it. Now then. <laughs> All right. So I guess that wraps it up for now. So as always, I am James Sabata. And I am Don Killery. And we'll see you eventually here on the Necronomic.com.